as you know, teachers and students at Tunghai, we have this Boya Jiayu, mm -hmm. and we have a Boya College, mm -hmm. right, which has been in existence for five years. Well, uh, Professor Thompson is not only someone who has studied, who has researched liberal arts and the origin of liberal arts in antiquity, but he is himself a representative of the intellectual program and education program that liberal arts stands for. Let me just very quickly explain what I mean by that. He actually has a BA degree in mathematics. <laughs> mathematics in Chinese <Chinesuche>. Sushi. <laughs> right? But now he's a famous professor in classics. That means the knowledge and culture of Greek and Roman antiquity. What is the journey? This is a wonderful thing to think about, a wonderful question to look into. What is the journey from mathematics to a career, a very distinguished mm -hmm. career, in teaching and researching uh, the humanities. Mm -hmm. Well, he started studying Latin and Greek as a senior student in college. So very much towards the end of his undergraduate education, he became interested in Latin and Greek, and he started studying Latin and Greek, and then went on to graduate studies in this field. And he became very distinguished uh, researcher say distinguished, one example, I think he has taught in more countries than I have been to. <laughs> at different times in his life, he's been a professor in, of course now he's teaching at New York University in the United States, uh, but before that he was a distinguished professor at Brown University in Rhode Island uh, in the United States for many, many years, but he also taught uh, in New Zealand, Scotland, are you following? I mean, the pain is flying very quickly. <laughs> Brazil. I mean, this is hopping around the world, right? Argentina, South Africa, Australia, and Egypt, and many other places. But I know from our conversation before we came here this morning that he has also been to China, he's been to Hong Kong, he's been to Macau, um, he traveled for many years in India and many other places. Um, he speaks Spanish. He also speaks some French. He speaks Italian. He has been to all these many places. Right? So, um, I think he's going to be very popular with the uh, AMI. <laughs> <laughs> Frequent traveler. Right? Uh, so, uh, an, an, an amazing uh, and very distinguished record as a scholar, as a teacher. Um, he's been involved also in um, he has been an editor of a number of very learned journals. Uh, and he has had many distinguished uh, scholarships and fellowships in the United States. But coming back to this idea of liberal arts, um, has he forgotten mathematics? No. He still represents very much all the different disciplines that he has been involved in from the time when he was a very young student until today. Though he has not been a professor of mathematics, he has studied, for example, the uh, classic mathematical tradition. And he has written and published on ancient mathematicians. He has published also on uh, atomic theory, because there was an old Greek guy who first, I mentioned this in my course, remember? Western Sin, you remember? <coughs> you don't remember them, why did I pass you? <laughs> I should have failed you. <laughs> All right, remember? An ancient Greek guy came up with this idea of the atom, atomic theory. Um, right? So there's a very interesting um, tradition of scientific inquiry and philosophical inquiry um, going back to the early Greek philosophers in Turkey, Ionia, Temple of Darius, right? Uh, the cosmologists, remember the cosmologists? I talked about them in, in, in my class. Right? So he is still working on these topics. So the undergraduate education in mathematics is not in vain. It is very much a part of who he is, of uh, the kind of a very three-dimensional, uh, holistic scholar that he has become through the course of his career. Anyway, he didn't come here to hear me talk about Professor Thompson. He came here to listen to him. And so without further ado, let's give the floor to Professor Thompson. Today he will talk about animal psychology and human nature and historical perspective. Welcome. I think, <clears throat> can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. Yeah. I'll stand here for 
for a bit. I'll move around a little because I um, have a text that I will read some of, but not exclusively. <clears throat> a scholar named Jeffrey Lloyd, who, by the way, has studied Chinese and ancient Greek philosophy as a comparison, wrote a book in which he spoke about the tendency of the ancient Greeks to think in polarities. And what he meant by that is oppositions. <clears throat> One thing is not another. And the Greeks did have a certain tendency to do this, in particular, and that's obviously what I'm going to look at, in the relationship between human beings and other animals. They had a contrast, rather than tending to see uh, a continuity. Now, they could also think in other ways, for example, in triplets. So you have, in the natural world, plants, animals, and human beings, each with its own characteristics. Or, on another level, animals, human beings, and gods. But when they look at plants and animals, and, and, sorry, animals and human beings in particular, they were disposed to see contrast and to find a point at which human beings were decisively different from other animals, rather than similar. This was their tendency. And around what point did they notice this difference? They marked this distinction, the possession of reason. Now, some of us may think that animals, or more advanced animals, have a certain degree of reason. For the Greeks, this was a less likely proposition. The word in Greek for reason is logos. And you know that word logos as the second part of terms like psychology, the logos of the psyche, of the soul, anthropology, the logos, the logic, the logic is another thing, of the human being, and so on. Logos in Greek meant reason, but it also meant language. When uh, Some of you may know that the um, Gospel of John and the Bible begins, in the beginning was the word. And the word in Greek, for word, is logos. It's that same term. It, we could have said, in the beginning was reason, and it would mean something similar. So for the Greeks, it was natural to associate the possession of reason with the possession of language. And since animals don't typically speak, it was natural to think that they did not possess the kind of reason that we do. The um, Greeks, as you may know, rejected the... Um, models of gods that had animal heads. They were familiar with them in Egypt, gods that had crocodile heads, and heads of cats, and heads of birds, but they rejected them in favor of gods that were human in form, and even if they had a, maybe horse's feet, the head had to be human so that it could speak. And by speaking, it would be divine, and a divinity without reason was inconceivable to them. Now, what's interesting about this distinction is that reason, for the Greeks, played a larger role in their conception of what it is to be human than we might think at first. So for example, for the Greeks, there was no such thing as virtue without reason. Now they had lists of virtues, and some of them, wisdom, maybe even justice or fairness, we could think of as pertaining specifically to human beings. But when it comes to a virtue like courage, you might imagine that certain animals are capable of courage. Uh, for the Greeks, that would not seem reasonable given their understanding of courage and the relationship between courage and reason, and courage and language, which I'm going to illustrate briefly. But there's a still more surprising conclusion that I held, well, that seemed evident to Greek thinkers and seems rather puzzling to us. And that is that without reason, you could not have emotion. So it's not only that an animal has courage in the strict sense of the word, even though you can train a horse to fight the enemy and be calm and uh, even in the face of wounds? No. Animals don't have anger. Animals
animals don't have love. Animals don't have fear. Now that seems counterintuitive to us. So what I want to do is illustrate how the Greeks thought about human beings and animals, how this contrast works, so that you can get some sense of what motivated this kind of thinking. The object of all of this is always twofold. It's double. On the one hand, it's to understand what the Greeks and the Romans thought and how they thought. On the other hand, it is to shed some light on our way of thinking and to become aware that there are other possibilities, how to organize our conceptual world. That's always the double angle of the study of any other culture. And while I'm at it, I will point out to you what you all of you already know, because you see, we're all comparatists and anthropologists because you speak English and you speak Chinese. And so you have two languages where the conceptual structures are similar but not always identical. And I'll always remind you, and I'm sure you already know, but there always comes a moment when you say to yourself, gee, I can say that in English, but I can't quite say it in Chinese and vice versa. <laughs> it just, there's, you know, I can get around it, I can do a paraphrase, but the word itself isn't there. And something's missing in the one language to the other. This isn't something to be ashamed of or disappointed in. This is the, the glory of learning multiple languages, that you have built into you mm -hmm. contrasting ways of thinking and your choice. You can, and, and, and I would imagine, I'm quite sure, that in ancient Chinese, as opposed to contemporary Chinese, there will be differences, evolutions, changes. And the same thing is true with ancient and modern Greek, ancient Latin and its modern descendants, like French and Italian, and so on. Well, what were they thinking when they made these arguments? OK, now I'm going to do some reading to you, because we have to look at the way they think. There is a, uh, a great Roman philosopher who lived around the first century AD, and sometimes thought that he was actually commuting. His, um, his brother knew St. Paul in the Bible. His brother was officiating when St. Paul was on trial. Uh, and he may have known St. Paul himself, so that gives you a time that he lived, about, let's say, around the first, middle of the first century AD. Okay? And he wrote a number of treatises. He was a Stoic philosopher, and one of them was called On Benefits or On Favors or Gifts, doing a service with kindness for someone else. And he says, what looks like an instance of kindness on the part of man. He says, we have seen a lion in the amphitheater, lions meet the gladiators, who, when he recognized, now there's men out there in the, in the amphitheater who are fighting the beasts. So you get a person who's got a spear, and they let three lions out against them. And here's a lion, and he recognized one of the men who was fighting the beast. See, that man had trained this lion. And he says, he put the lion protected the man he recognized against the other animals. Now, this kind of story of a lion who has helped a person that he recognized is a very familiar one. You may know the story of the ancient Christian who took a thorn out of the paw of a lion, and then when he was thrown to the lions, to Savage him, the lion recognized him and was grateful and only licked him. We have many such stories. So what is this? Is this a sign of kindness or gratitude on the part of the lion? Not according to Seneca. Here's what Seneca says. He says, was this assistance on the part of the, he's quoting me now, on the part of this wild beast a benefit? No. Why? Because he neither, the lion neither wished to do it, nor did it do it deliberately. Think about what this means. The lion didn't intend to do a service. It did it, it recognized it, protected it, but it wasn't intentional. He's telling you that it was an accident or a consequence of simple instinct. And he gives a very curious example of case where intention matters. He says, suppose there's a tyrant, a dictator, and you go up and you intend to kill the dictator. So you throw
throw your spear at him. But you miss. Well, you don't quite miss. What happens is the dictator had a terrible tumor growth on his shoulder. And the spear comes and cuts off the tumor and saves his life. <laughs> well, is the dictator going to be grateful to you? No, you were trying to kill him. So you see that what you do isn't the question. What you intended to do is what constitutes the benefit. That's how Seneca reasons. Now, in this same book, he makes it clear that even wild beasts, well, let me give you the context. He says, suppose you do a favor for somebody, and they're not grateful. What should you do? Should you stop doing favors? He says, no, do a second one. And do a third one. Because very often, the second, the third, the fourth, wakens the gratitude on the part of the other person. And then he gives an example. He says, you can even see this with animals, because a lion trainer can put his hand in the mouth of a lion, and it doesn't hurt. And he says, food, if you feed an elephant even, it makes it docile, it makes it peaceful. So you can train animals by giving them food over and over again, by training over and over again. Well, would this be an example of gratitude on the part of the animal? It's no. He says, this is the extent to which when you persist in doing a favor, even those creatures who have no intelligence and cannot appreciate what a favor is, even they can be trained to be mild. And his point is, if a creature can be trained to be mild, we can too. But training, which we are subject to, is not the same thing as the emotion. If I am trained to salivate whenever I see food, <clears throat> that's not exactly the same thing as appreciating it. And you can see why. If I do you a service, eventually you have to take into account my intention. You need to know that I did the service out of kindness and that I wasn't trying to kill you and accidentally cure your tumor. Well, does an animal know Let's say I have a pig and I am feeding it every day and it comes and warms up to me and I feed it every day. Well, why am I feeding it? So that it will get fat and I will eat it. <laughs> well, should the pig be grateful? <laughs> well, it would have to know the difference. The pig is neither grateful nor ungrateful because it does not appreciate the motive. Now, this is the way the Greeks think about all of these matters. I'll give you another example from the same philosopher. He has three books dedicated to different chapters, I would say, a book, a volume, dedicated to anger, the subject of anger, in which he's really trying to explain why one ought never to be truly angry. Because to be angry with somebody means that person can harm you. And if you have the right attitude toward life, you are really invulnerable to harm because most what somebody else can do to you is only in trivial things. He stole my money. Well, how important is money? That's how you should be thinking. That's Seneca's view as a stone. But let's look what he says. He says, we must say that wild animals, and I'm quoting him, and all creatures apart from human beings are without anger. Why? For since anger is contrary to reason, because if I were thinking, I would know I shouldn't be angry, it does not arise except where reason has a place. In other words, in order to be angry, I must have, I must be going contrary to reason. But I can't go contrary to reason unless I'm already rational. Animals are neither contrary to reason nor with reason. They don't have reason at all. So what do animals have? You've seen animals that look like they're angry. He says they have violence, ferocity, aggression, but they don't have anger any more than they have licentiousness. Licentiousness may be a word you don't know. It's a word meaning like shamelessness in regard to sexuality and other things. In other words, if your dog, and I put it, 
your dog isn't going to be ashamed if you pick it out on the street without a daddy. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have corrupt behavior. Their sexuality is not corrupt. They don't have the rational awareness to be shameless because they don't have shame. <clears throat> so if you don't have shame, you can't be shameless. Only human beings can be truly shameless because we have the capacity for shame. And if your dog doesn't have the capacity for shame, some of you will think, oh, yes, you have the capacity for shame, and sometimes you'll stop. It's a kind of quasi-capacity. It's not the whole thing. So he says, the attacks and outbreaks of animals are violent, but they do not have fears and worries, sadness and anger, but rather things that are similar to these. See, when that dog gets aggressive toward you, it's responding instinctively, and it's not full anger, because anger would have to be something else. Anger would have to be, I know this person treats me in a certain way, and I resent it. I often give this example, just in case, um, you, know, you know, if somebody comes up behind you and gives you a sudden push, now what do you feel? Maybe angry? And then you discover that the person saw a car coming and pushed you out of the way of the car and saved your life at that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, now what do you feel? You feel grateful. So your first anger, if you were angry, instead of just, you know, you might just feel an aggressive impulse. Somebody pushes you, you feel an aggressive impulse. That a dog can feel too. But if you were angry for a moment, it's because you thought that person pushed you without a reason for doing so. Mm -hmm. To humiliate you, to get you out of the way, who is this person to push me? And then as soon as you realize that the intention was different, the emotion changes. This can't happen with animals. So you'll see how reason is essential to an emotion on the concept, the way the ancient thinkers uh, <coughs> conceived of it. Near the beginning of the same book on, on anger, or in the middle actually, Seneca says that there are things that are not exactly emotions, but what he calls the initial preliminaries to emotion, the kind of starting points for emotion, but they're not really emotions. And what kinds of things are they? Well, he says, when you shiver in the cold, that's not, it's not an emotion exactly, right? And then he says, when, when you feel kind of funny about certain things you touch, you stick your hand in a, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay? And then he says, when your hair stands on end after you've received bad news. I vaguely remember when that could happen to me. Um, <laughs> blushing. You blush, but, you know, just not hearing certain kinds of things. Dizziness when you look over a height. And then he says, the sentiments we feel when we go to the theater or we read a book. Because I'm sitting reading the book or watching the movie, and I see all kinds of terrible things happening. And am I afraid? It's a horror movie. Am I afraid? If I were afraid, I would run out of the movie theater. But I know, because I know it's not real. I know it's accurate. And so there's an involuntary response, but it's not a real emotion, because for it to be a real emotion, I have to think if I'm afraid, this can harm me. And if I don't, I don't think it can harm me, then I am not going to be afraid, fully afraid. So what do I have? I have a pre-emotion. I have a proto-emotion. I have something that's the starting point of an emotion, but doesn't get all the way there, mm -hmm. because it needs the rational quality to be complete. And he even says, if you're a soldier and you hear the trumpet, you know, something start up. And then he says, this happens to military horses too. And that's the point of contact between where animals and human beings are operating on the same wavelength. <clears throat> well, I said animals don't even have fear. When you look at anger, what about fear? In order to go for fear, I'm going to take another passage, not from Seneca, who says these things explicitly but from an Epicurean philosopher. This guy lived in the first century before Christ. These are the guys who believed in the atomic theory. Everything was matter in the form of atoms and void. That's it. You needed to explain everything through matter, atoms, and space. And they had a very primitive conception of atoms. Uh, they didn't have forces. They didn't have wavelengths. They didn't have 
all of it. So if you want to explain vision, how does somebody see something? How do I see an object? Well, it's got to be explained in terms of atoms and, and, and emptiness, right? So what happens is every creature, ourselves, every table, ceiling, emits a thin film all the time. And those films fly very fast, and they come banging up against our eyes, and that produces sight. It's not totally different from my eyes. And now, these fingers had to explain all sorts of odd events by this mechanism. Earthquakes, magnetism, very complex things. At one point, this poet, he's a poet, decides he's going to explain a very odd fact, or it was a fact according to the Greeks. Namely, why are lions afraid of roosters? This was a widespread belief. I, don't, I didn't hear this when I was a child, but I did hear that elephants are afraid of mice. Any of you hear that one? Mm -hmm. And you know why. Because on one theory, they thought the mice could run up their trunk. That's what I was taught when I was a child. <laughs> now, if an elephant looked at a mouse and said, I'm afraid of that mouse because that mouse, I know that mouse can run up my trunk, then he would have real fear. Why? Because he knows there's a danger and he's reacting to the danger. He's intelligent. And he says, I've got to avoid that mouse because he can run up my trunk. But not so long ago, I read a scientific interpretation. And it said, the real reason is that mice emit a very high-pitched, shrill sound. Elephants have very big, sensitive ears. And that sound hurts their ears, and that's why they avoid that's what I read in the newspaper. Okay, keep that in mind when you listen to what I'm about to read to you. He says, it's no wonder that lions are afraid of roosters because in the bodies of roosters, there are certain constituents, certain elements, okay, parts, which, when they are introduced into the eyes of lions, remember this theory that the parts of the rooster are coming flying out like this, they dig into their pupils and produce a sharp pain. So that fierce as they are, the lions cannot resist them. Although, and now I need an explanation, these same constituents don't harm our eyes. Why not? Well, he doesn't know, but he says, either because they don't penetrate them, or they do penetrate, but then they are given free access to get out again. That's how our eyes are built. And so they don't do, cause us any pain. So what's going on here? <coughs> Lions avoid roosters. Do they avoid them because they're afraid? So to be afraid, we would need the first interpretation of the elephant and the ox. In other words, I know that this rooster can come and peck me and hurt me. But that's not why the lion avoids a rooster. The lion avoids the rooster according to the second interpretation, the noise that affects the ears. The sight of a rooster, for some reason, hurts the eyes of a lion. So what is the lion doing when it runs away and a rooster comes? Is it afraid, or is it just avoiding pain, the same way you stick your hand on a hot plate and you didn't know it was hot, and you pulled your hand away? That's not fear. That's just an aversion to pain. And so Lucretius is explaining that what looks like fear isn't fear. It's just what Seneca was saying. It's a proto-fear. It's got to do with fear, aversion to pain. It's got to do with fear. But it's a different thing from knowing that something is harmful and having an emotion based on knowledge. Now, this, I have to tell you, is my own contribution to this discussion. It's not one that everyone cares for. I'll give you another example. Many of you will think, and, and probably Remember here, I am describing what ancient thinkers in Greece believed. That animals can mourn or feel grief. You see that uh, this same Lucretius is trying, the same philosopher, is trying to explain that animal, why, how many different kinds of atoms there are. There are many, many, many kinds of different kinds of atoms. And you know why I know? He says, because every single one of us looks different. And if there were only a few kinds of atoms, well, you could make a human being out of them, but we'd all look alike. 
and he gives proof. And the proof is that animals can recognize each other too. And he says, often a calf, a baby calf, which has been sacrificed in front of a temple of the gods, falls, he's very poetic, at the incense-bearing altars, pouring a warm river of blood from its breast. But its mother wanders through the green fields, recognizes the traces left by the footprints of its baby calf. In other words, it can tell, these are my calf's traces. That's how many, how precise it is. It looks everywhere with its eyes, if perhaps she may find her lost newborn. It's a newborn calf. And she stops and fills the woods with her cries, and again and again returns to the stable, transfixed with longing for the calf. And the tender willows, and the grass that's bright with dew, and the rivers that are flowing on their in their banks cannot delight her or distract her from her worry for her calf. And other calves from other cows in the meadows cannot distract or relieve her mind. That's how much she seeks her own. In other words, she knows it's not someone else's calf. She knows it's hers. And that's why they know her calves. But look at this picture. What are we describing in the case of this calf? Are we describing grief? Many scholars have talked to me, and they think of it, oh, the war, terrible sacrifices that are done, harm to animals, look how it hurts the mother. This mother cow, there's no indication that this mother cow knows that the calf was sacrificed. After all, if it did, it wouldn't wander around looking for it, would it? Keeps going back to the stable to find it. It's a newborn calf, so it's very, it's, it's nursing. We go back and look for the calf. No, it's looking for it because it doesn't know what happened to it. Now, I would say maybe the calf has gone to, you know, has got a scholarship to study in Taiwan. <laughs> in which case, the cow should be happy for the calf. As your parents would be. So your parents, it would make a great difference if you were missing from home, if they think you have been kidnapped, or they think you have gone to school in another place. It's a big difference. With the cow, this is not a question. The cow isn't mourning because it thinks that harm has been done to the calf. The cow is mourning only now, can we feel sad when we're separated? Of course. You may miss your parents. Some of you who are far away from home, your parents probably don't miss you much, but maybe they do a little. <laughs> OK? But they miss you not because they think anything is happening. They're not grieving. They're just feeling the absence. And Lucretius is pointing up the difference between a mere absence and real grief because the whole message of Epicureanism was death is not harmful. Death is not bad. Death is not punishment. Death is simply a natural fact. We miss people, but we don't grieve because of harm done to them. Now, I'll give you a couple of more examples of how the grief can be. If the cat cat is feeling the loss of its calf. It's not grieving, it doesn't think something bad is happening. It doesn't know what's happening. It couldn't know. It can't think in those terms. But it is feeling the loss. So if it's feeling the loss, did it love its offspring? And that's why it's feeling the loss? What are the options? And to get a handle on this, and again, I tell you, I'm the one who's putting together these different pieces of information. When I say I'm the one who's doing it, 
This is not standard interpretation. This is my own work that I'm sharing with you on these problems. This is my own research. Well, so I went to a passage in Aristotle in which Aristotle was talking about friendship. It was a very interesting way. The, let me just tell you that the word for friendship in Aristotle in Greek is the same as the word for love. The same word. The word is philia. You sometimes see it in, in um, like uh, anglophile, somebody who loves England. That's the file, the lover. Okay, Philadelphia, the city, the city of brotherly love, loving your brothers. <clears throat> so, Aristotle is talking about friendship. And so he needs to tell you what is friendship. Is it love? Yes. And then he goes, why do you love somebody? Well, you love somebody sometimes because they're useful to them. You love someone because they give you pleasure. But most importantly, you love someone because of their character. That's why, that's the most fundamental basis. I love somebody because I have a good character. Not for pleasure, not for utility, but anybody for their character. But for any of those reasons. Now, what about friendship? Well, friendship is two-way love. That's the way Aristotle is. We're the old ones. In other words, if we're friends, he said, I love you and you love me. This is not, the Greeks have a separate word, a very separate word for erotic love. Not the same word. Erotic love is eros. And they're not talking about this. They're talking about affection. Let's call it that. Affection. So if we're friends, I feel affection for you and you feel affection for me. By itself, that's not enough. It was interesting because they think it's rude. And he says, you know, you could feel a certain affection for me right now because maybe like four of your teachers whom you know and you admire and you feel affection for. And that teacher may feel a certain affection for you because they think you're a good student and they've really watched your progress. But neither of you knows what the other is feeling. You're not friends. So it has to be mutual affection and each one knows what the other one is feeling. That's what Aristotle said. Now you're friends. Okay. And then he goes on to illustrate an aspect of friendship. He says, well, friendship, I love you, and you are loved by me. Does friendship really reside more in loving or in being loved? Which is the more important one? And Aristotle says, in loving, not in being loved. In loving is the more important element than being loved. You're friends with somebody, the affection you feel is more basic somehow than the delight you feel in the affection from the other person. They're both relevant. They both have to be there, but he's separating out the elements. And then he gives you an example. And the example is an interesting one. He says, I have seen cases. That's the music. This is my, my background music. You get a prize for this. Okay, um, now, he said, I've seen mothers who have given their children up for adoption to some other family. And they continue to have an interest in those children, even though the child doesn't know who its real mother is. They don't tell the child, because they want the child to be fully member of that adoption. And the mother continues to feel the love even though the child cannot and will never reciprocate the love or offer the benefits and services that a child ordinarily should be expected to offer to a parent. So he concludes that this is more basic. And one of the ancient commentators writing about Aristotle, in Greek, going back to the second century AD, Say, wait, something's wrong here. Aristotle was talking about friendship. And he said it has to go two ways. And here all of a sudden there's this one way love. Maybe he's somehow changed his subject. What's going on? Maybe he means something slightly different. And once upon a time I agreed with this critic, but now I think he actually has another thing in mind. What he says is the mother's love for that child is the and in another passage, he says, in the same book, he says, love seems to exist naturally. That word naturally is important. 
in a parent toward offspring, not only among human beings, but also among birds and animals. That's the critical thing. It exists in birds and animals as much as it exists in human beings naturally. Now, by naturally, I think we can substitute in modern English instinct. Yes, a mother bird that is bringing worms to its young has an instinctive attachment to the young. But it's not the same as human love, which involves a desire for the well-being of the other that is intentional and rational. In other words, if I am raising the animal, the chicken, in order to eat it later, that's a very different kind of relation, even though I'm feeding it, and that little chick may become very attached to me. But it's not an attachment based on its knowledge of my desire for its well-being. And my relation to it is not based on its instrumental. I want to use it rather than feel an independent affection for it. To really have love, you have to intentionally desire the well-being of the other person. That's what Aristotle defines love as being. I have to want you to fare well, to do well, in your own terms. And I have to want that Aristotle specifies for your sake and not for mine. If it's for my sake, it doesn't matter. So the love of a baby is instinctive in humans and in animals. Remember, Aristotle says we love another creature because of another human being because either they give us pleasure, or they are useful to us, or they are virtuous. Now, according to Aristotle, an infant can no more be virtuous than a human than an animal because it doesn't have reason yet. So we don't love, you don't love a baby because it's just or honest or wise. He has got none of those qualities yet. You don't love it because it's useful. It's not going to take you out or give you money. Not not yet, maybe in the future. And you certainly, if you've ever had a baby, you don't love it because it gives you any pleasure. Cry in the middle of the night. You endure it because you have to, you have to, uh, you, you are instinctively attached to it, and it's a good thing we are instinctively attached. Because if we weren't, then we would be, um, we wouldn't endure those creatures. I'll take one more example, and then I'm going to go on to a couple more points. This has to do with pity and fear. You may have heard that Aristotle wrote a book on tragedy called the Poetic. And he says, tragedy inspires in us pity and fear. Pity when somebody is suffering who does not deserve to suffer. That's the crucial thing. It's his definition. When someone doesn't deserve to suffer and is suffering, we feel pity. He says, you don't feel pity when somebody is justifiably suffering. And he gives an example in another place. He says, you know, if a criminal has murdered 50 people and is now led out to be put in jail, you don't feel pity for that person. You don't feel sorrow for that person. You're glad that. And so he says, when you see a play, you're watching a play, a movie, in which a very bad person suffers, well then, you aren't going to feel pity. But he says, you may have a kind of, he calls it a humane reaction. You may feel a humane reaction. In other words, think of a movie you've seen where the really bad guy is finally getting it you kind of almost instinctively feel something bad. You, you, there's a sympathy in spite of everything. Pity is an emotion. Instinctive sympathy, which again, we share with animals. An animal could very often see, let's say, a, a, a dog you would see, a, a puppy, or even someone's a cat, and the dog across species is hurt, and the other animal comes and protects, protects it and takes care of it. The animal doesn't say, let me just stop for a minute. Is this other one that's hurt, did he start the fight or did the other one start the fight? That's not what they ask. They're not making a moral judgment. They're responding to the, the mere fact of seeing pain. That's instinctive. So these are all the differences. Now, the ancient thinkers knew that animals can be fairly supportive all kinds of abilities. And they wondered about them. 
Seneca, whom I mentioned at the beginning, he says, you know what's funny? A little chicken will hide underneath its mother if it sees a cat coming, but not if it sees a dog. And another Stoic philosopher says, you know, I've seen, they can tell the difference between an aggressive bird and a non-aggressive bird. And even if the non-aggressive bird is very big and the aggressive bird is small. He says, I've seen chickens, little chicks, and there's a bull marching around and even jumping, prancing, jumping around, and they're not afraid. And a small cat comes out in the corner and they run under it. So they are very sophisticated. You see how that instinctive reaction, they know what to fear and not to fear. And it's in court, what to react to and avoid and not to avoid. And it's a good thing they do. That's how they survive. It says also they can tell what parts of another animal are dangerous. And when you see in the arena a lion is made to fight with a bull, it pushes up the horns. If it's made to fight with a wild donkey, it walks down to the kicking part. So animals are very sophisticated. It's just that they don't have the beliefs and the judgments that, that say, that's the part of the animal that's harmed here. That's the part I have to avoid. Because I know harm. They do it because they're instinctive. And one of the ways you know it's instinctive is that they eat the newborn chicken every day. See, from the very beginning, human beings tend to lack those sophistication. Now, I will um, conclude with just a couple of passages from Christian writers who are writing later on. They were very much indebted to the Greek philosophers. They acquired much of their way of explaining the Christian faith from the Greek and Roman philosophers who preceded it. I told you that Seneca may even have known St. Paul. There's actually letters between Seneca and St. Paul that are probably not genuine, but they were written very soon after. So that the Christians saw in Seneca a kind of potential saint. And they borrowed freely from these writers. And they could use um, their intellectual, this intellectual tradition for a very different purpose, to defend Christian values or uh, in, in one way or another. So one of the things they could do with these remarkable skills, the spider weaving its web, the bee making the absolutely perfect, mathematically perfect honeycomb, they could use this as a sign of divine providence and wisdom and the way the universe testifies to the creator. So here I will give you a very brief quote from a passage really at the end now, by a uh, saint named Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the Eastern Greek saints. And he says, how is it that birds know where to build their nests? How do spiders produce such great works of art? And bees, angles with straight lines that no geometer could ever imitate. What about ants and the way they save up everything and store it for the future. And all of this, he says, is a testimony to God's providence and God's role in the universe. But if the Christians could take the wisdom even of animals and say it's not due to animal intelligence, notice, it's due to the fact that God gave them these powers to defend themselves and to create, they could also do what the Greeks did and argue that it was reason that made human beings of a higher level than the animals. Because the Greeks could borrow, the, Greek, the, the Christians could borrow from the Greek pagan philosophers the idea that because animals don't have reason, they don't have unreason. Because they don't have reason, they can't have justice, but then they can't have injustice. And if animals cannot have injustice, and one of the things they cannot do is they cannot sin. An animal cannot commit a sin. We don't think of an animal as committing a sin. We can because we know what we ought to do and therefore we 
know what we ought not to do, and that's what sinning is. And so I'm going to take a passage from Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa, they're dealing with two towns. There are two men named Gregory, and they were very close friends, writing in the fourth century AD. And he says, our love of pleasure took its beginning, why do we love pleasure and be so much addicted to it? From our being made, we were created similar to irrational animals. Why? This became increased by human transgression, by human offenses, by human sins, which be and became the parent of many sins arising from pleasure. Animals are attracted by pleasure. We are attracted by pleasure. We have an animal part in our nature, but what we do with that attraction to pleasure produces sins that um, that go beyond it. He says, now, anger in us is similar to the impulse of animals, similar. But anger grows, and I'm quoting him, by the alliance of thought. When thought combines with the impulse, that's when it becomes anger. For from this come malignity, envy, deceit, conspiracy, hypocrisy. All of these are the result of the evil husbandry, the evil nursing of the mind. For if passion were divested of, or separated, if our passions were separated from the assistance that they received from thought, as I'm still quoting, then anger is left behind. It's short. It passes like a bubble. He says pigs are greedy, right? But in us, that greediness turns into covetousness. We want everything that everyone else has. We want anything envious. We're not just eager for a little bit of food. We want nobody else to have as much as we have. He says, the high spirits of a horse, that becomes our pride. And all the particular forms that proceed from the absence of reason in animal natures become vices in us by the evil use of the mind. So we see how Gregory has taken this distinction between rationality and non-rational, not irrational, but non-rational. The animals are non-rational, they have impulses. We, by our thinking, convert them into um, what, well, as long as they govern our thinking, instead of our thinking governing them, they become vices. If our thinking governs them, they become virtues. That's the next thing that he says. And so I'm going to conclude now, this is the last, from a quotation from a man named Pliny, who was a kind of, he wrote a huge encyclopedia of knowledge in the middle of the first century, but at the same time that Seneca was writing. Uh, first century AD, <clears throat> he uh, explored everything, he was interested in everything. When Mount Vesuvius blew up a big uh, volcano in Italy, he immediately went to see it and, uh, and he died, and he guessed. So he, that was the last of his encyclopedic uh, discovery. But he says, and I just finished with this last quotation, only one animal has mourning. Mourning and grief. You see the same point that Lucretius was making? Only one animal mourns. Not that they don't feel separation, only one animal mourns. Only one animal has extravagance, luxury, in very many ways. Only one animal has ambition, or greed, or a limitless passion to go on living, want to live forever. Only one animal has that. Only one has superstition. Mm -hmm. Only one has a concern for burial and what will happen to us after death. No other animal's life is more fragile than ours, but none has a greater passion for all things or more indefinite fear, or more bitter rage. Finally, all other animals live righteously within their own species. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but he means to say that lion, you know, dogs don't attack other dogs, and wolves don't eat other wolves, they cross species. But human beings, the majority of evils <laughs> for human beings come from man. OK, and with that distinction, I give you, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Constable. We will take questions. Yes.
What do you think? Question. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody? Okay. I know we have many animal lovers among our students. <laughs> Here's an animal lover. Okay. And also the question about the reason. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was young, I brought up a puppy from two or three days old. Mm -hmm. His mistress wanted to drown him, and I didn't like it. I brought it home. And we fed it with a dropper or a feeding bottle. And he was very, very close to me. Now, in the meantime, I mean, a year, a couple of months later, my elder brother had a daughter. And her mother one day, you know, oiled her and put her to sunbathe. And left her there. It's a little off sink, covered up. And I heard my dog, he used to call him Snoops, he used to snoop around the place, barking his head off. So I came to see what happened. And I found this Snoops had dragged his water bowl and his feeding tray in front of this baby, wanting to soothe her. I was fascinated. And after that, I started calling him Smarty because he exhibited rationality. He could think, actually. Like, I used to go around watering my flowers. He follows me in the morning, and I brush him, and I go in. And he wouldn't let anyone touch my flowers. You know, that way I found him that he was really, I mean, he was like part human. The fact that he was brought up as a baby by human being, by me. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely close. In the morning, he would push my door, I used to leave the bolt in the way. He would push the door, bolt would fall open, he would open the door, come and then drag me out of bed to play with him and stuff like that. Very, very human. Now, how do you explain that kind of behavior? Well, uh, <laughs> of course, the question, the question is, how would these ancient Greek thinkers explain it? Now, we have to realize that the ancient Greek thinkers knew animals very well. And Aristotle, many of his works are biology. He examined them very carefully. They lived with animals all the time. They were very aware that animals could be trained. Uh, they were very aware that animals could do, as I gave some description, very sophisticated things. And they could also learn. But they learned through training rather than through what we would call education. They don't have critical minds. So the um, dogs obviously couldn't protect sheep. Horses could be trained to fight in these battles. Um, the, um, what else did they tend to train? Um, uh, falcons, various things to hunt uh, other birds. They knew that these animals had very sophisticated capacities. So the absence of language you know, uh, if you suddenly started to mistreat this animal that was so kind to you, it would be a very complex thing for the creature because they are accustomed to performing these deeds for you. Now they become attached and they are going to have a very hard time saying that my master is in a very bad mood this morning and he has, you know, they don't know what's happening. They came to value the attention. Now, I tend to say something like this, and here's a slightly more different level in which to analyze these problems. Having shown you what the ancient Greeks saw and the thing, let's ask, why should they think that way? Now, this is a bigger question. Now we're not asking them why they think that way. To them, it looks natural. We are more inclined to see continuity between ourselves and the animals. Why did they want to separate? so concerned with separate? Why didn't they say, oh, well, they have a shared reason, and let it go at that? Why didn't they say, okay, it's not fully here, but it's close enough? Why bother? And here's where I think we get many reasons. One of them is that they were all the ancient philosophers were concerned with how to live a good life. This is really what they were writing about. They weren't writing so much about animals, except incidentally. So Aristotle just tells you this little story about animals loving their young in a book dedicated to ethics and friendship. Seneca's writing on favors and benefits, he's not writing about animals, he's writing about the human, the human behavior. And animals are used illustratively by way of contrast. And I think here, they're, what their minds are fixed on is that the way to live a righteous life, a good life, a kind life, has to be by appealing to your reason. And in this respect, we don't usually treat animals that way. And 
I give an example. Some of you have heard of Socrates. You know that he was condemned to death by the Athenians for his wisdom. The book about Socrates. And when he was on trial, he said, you know, you can't hurt me. You can't do any harm to me. You're putting me to death, and you think you're doing harm to me. But how many of you know what happens when you die? For all I know, I'll go to the afterlife, and I will meet all the great thinkers, and I'll have a wonderful time. And you and all your people who think you harm me, he said, he said, there is one thing that I know that is bad. One thing that harms the human soul. And that's to do an injustice. Mm -hmm. And since you're doing an injustice to me, you're hurting yourselves. But you don't know you're hurting me. Now, all of this kind of reasoning, in the last analysis, you cannot, you can't do with that dog, no matter how sophisticated it is. And I think it's, it's, it's their attention to these issues the way that philosophy is so deeply embedded in psychology mm -hmm. and in right values that makes them draw these contrasts. That and their habit of thinking in polarities. So that's the where I would, that, that's a, a meta answer. What I mean by that is that's my answer, looking to their whole cultural tradition and trying to explain why they don't come up with our kinds of thinking. Thank you. If I could follow up, I know it's a very big question, and it's a different research project, but what do you think has caused the change in our thinking? Why do we now believe in animal rights? And, you know, <laughs> one society yes. which we discuss very much in our department, because we're the English department, is mm -hmm. England. Yeah. And we yes. have English are animal lovers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been accused of caring more about animals than about poor people. Yes. Yes. And they do. Yes. And they do. We have a society that has become very individual. Oddly enough, I think there is a relationship between animal loving and individualism. I'll give you a different kind of illustration for a moment. In magazines, every week there is a story about how to go on a diet. And you how to keep fit. Every week. Every week, what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. Do you know how many that, that, that today 50 times more people have allergies than they had 20 years? They're allergic to everything. Yep. And one of the reasons for this is that, you know, many of you, which is a surprising sight for a person coming from the United States, wear masks. I go down the escalator today in the train station, and it said, every certain number of seconds, yes. the handle on the escalator is sanitized. Yes. So I have to worry about putting my hand on the What this does is make each of us think, especially in the United States, Health is due entirely to our personal choices. And that a simple solution like providing adequate care for everybody through social practices, we don't bother with that. Everything, we are all individuals in all single, in all respects. So we are isolated from the social world. We are each totally responsible for our behaviors. Well, in this sense, I think it's a of reduction of the individual to his wholly private zone. Mm -hmm. And that private zone, it's very convenient to include animals. Because my dog loves me without judging whether I'm good or bad, without my judging its intentions. I don't need to think about social values. I don't need to think about good and bad. I only need to go home and know that whatever else happens, the dog licks my hand. I have my gluten-free uh, bread in the freezer. I have, you know, my uh, everything, my, my smoke-reducing uh, anti-contaminants, and I wash my hands six times and so on, and I'm fine. And I think there is a kind of, of uh, depersonalization in interpersonal relations that has created a big space for pets. Now, this doesn't mean to say that our conclusions about animal reasoning is wrong. That, that I don't mean to say that. It's that our perceptions are governed by other needs, and they actually can be scientifically positive. We can now, because of our affection for animals, look more closely at how they behave and how they think and see many points of contact. Whereas the Greeks, looking for something different, saw fewer points, although in other contexts. I mean, I point out that the ancient Greeks did also, some of them, believe in vegetarianism. 
and they believed in vegetarians, they would argue things like this. Look, you use the ox. That ox draws your plow. You work the fields together. It's your brother. Holy cow. Holy cow, and you do not care and eat it. So it's not that the Greeks couldn't think this way, but their dominant look was one way, and our dominant look was another. That's a partial, very partial answer. But, I have a question about that uh, uh, animal law in, in modern times. Or what I call a famous question about that. The, now we have, in the hospital, we have this dog doctor, you know, that they actually visit the, uh, patients. And then they, they kind of uh, go and pay visits to these patients, hospitalize them in the hospital. And then they, they, they call them dog doctors or cat doctors. So they can provide a kind of comfort or the kind of uh, healing kind of power, okay, to well, I hope they aren't doing it to people who are afraid of dogs and cats. <laughs> well, <laughs> then, then it works. The point is that it works so well, and, and the dogs and the cats, they don't get paid for doing this, but the, 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 the cares, okay, of this dog and, and cats, or cats do. So I I'm just think, wondering, you know, yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, how do you look at that with human psychology? You know, we know that yeah. we talk about uh, animal psychology and human nature, but when it comes to this part, we talk about human psychology, that how human beings, you know, especially in illness or in... in I yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good question and it's a good illustration. And I think I hear I do have an answer in terms of what the Greeks were thinking. Mm -hmm. Remember, when I say human beings have virtues and emotions that animals don't have because they don't have reason, mm -hmm. I am not saying that we don't also have those instinctive starting points. We have those too. Yeah. We shiver when we're cold, just as animals do. When we're frightened, we have certain physiological expressions. We blush, animals don't. Well, Mark Twain said, human beings are the only animal that blush, or need to. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, uh, but, you know, so we also have those instincts. And so we too, we have internal love. We have instinctive love. And as babies, we have the need for that love. We have what is called in modern psychology an attachment. So that attachment at the pre-emotional level can be met and satisfied by any creature that shows us affection. So if that dog is trained to show love in a certain way toward people, it is touching a very basic need that we have. And it can substitute quite adequately for a human being in the, on that level. So there's the difference is when we love our dog, are we loving it because it's giving us a kind of uh, a fundamental instinctive affection that almost replaces the maternal affection that we miss even as adults? Mm -hmm. Or are we thinking that that dog is as good as a friend? Mm -hmm. And for the Greeks, they would say, give us one without the other. It's not a friend, mm -hmm. but it is something that has a basic affection that means something we need. And we continue to have those needs throughout our life. So it's a very good example. I haven't known about the dog doctor, but I, I like the example. Uh, yeah. It works. Uh, can I give another example? Uh, there's one more question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just have a question about In terms of animal, which kind of love you Good believe question. that they are able to capable? It's an excellent, an excellent question. I, I wrote a paper on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's wonderful. I, should I asked the question. In Greek, you know, there are actually four words for love, but I'll give you the two basic ones. One is this word I just mentioned, affection. Mm -hmm. The other is that erotic love. You fall in love. And so I asked the question, I wrote a paper, can animals fall in love? They have sex that we know, we would think, things we produce, but are they falling in love? Now, falling in love, some of the ancient writers pointed out some of the problems with being in love. You exaggerate the good qualities of the other person. So how many of you have been in love? Those two having a conversation, are you in love over there, or you are? No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you in love? No, these two. You're, you're, 
You? You. Are you in love? Yeah. Good. Do you think you estimate exactly correctly all the qualities of the person you love, or do you sometimes exaggerate? Sometimes. Sometimes exaggerate. Now, this is what the ancients said. They said, you know, being in love is a curse. It's terrible. And it's the worst, worst basis for making a choice of a partner. Because you're going to make a mistake. The Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, and right down until recently, held that in order for a marriage to be valid, you must enter into it voluntarily. When you're in love, you're not in control of your own will. Therefore, you can, one of the reasons for dissolving a marriage is that I got married when I was in love, and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I had a complete mistake about that person. So, when animals, do they have that ability? When an animal goes, you know, the, the bull goes for the cow, does it say, that cow is the most beautiful cow in the world, even though, and all the other bulls are saying, why, she's ugly. I don't know what that bull sees in that cow. And I said, because the bulls don't have beliefs, they're just attracted, it doesn't operate on that level. So I was trying to argue they can't be in love. But it's a very, very good question, and it, you know, it's complicated. He has to the play, much as no but nothing. He did, and it's all the nothing. And a comedy of errors, probably a comedy of errors. Yeah. <laughs> probably a pun in Shakespeare. So, uh, so you see the problem. So I'm not I've got your attention. When I talk about love, you have fear, no, nothing. Shame, nothing. But love, yes. <clears throat> Suspicion, jealousy. Jealousy is another one. You see, they have and they can want to control, but is it jealousy? Uh, here I was arguing about Greek too. You know, when I'm jealous. It's because I think that the person I love loves someone else. It's not just control. It's more than that. If it's just control, then it doesn't count. It's got to be alienation or affection. Do animals have this? These are the kinds of questions that I have been trying to look at. And let me go back and repeat again. All of you have a deep knowledge of Chinese. When you read old Chinese texts, it doesn't have to be 3,000 years ago. It can be 2,000, 1,000, 500 years ago, 200 years. Concepts and the attitudes they work with the same as or different from those today. What did they think about animals? It could have been more sensitive, it could have been less. What caused them to think one way or another? Now, I don't believe that in every case ancient views are different from ours. It's got to be one by one. Were their views of friendship like ours? I think they were. Were their views of erotic love like ours? Slightly different. What about anger? Somewhat different from ours. You have to look case by case. But that's what makes it really interesting. And you can do it, you have the capacity to do it with basically three languages, old Chinese, modern Chinese, and English. You can triangulate, you say. Oh, look, this is a, this would be an incredible resource you have. And by the way, it's not done enough in, in our studies. Uh, it's, it's an open area for uh, research. It's still a wide open area. Even what I'm doing here is an open area. It's still new stuff in I, this article I wrote about can animals fall in Nobody asked the question. We have stories about animals being very affectionate toward human beings. The, the dolphins that protect. We have a story about um, elephants that love human beings, snakes that come up and are attached to human beings. And so I looked at all these stories and I said, is it erotic? For example, do they want sex? And I couldn't find any examples. They are take care of humans. But they don't want sex with human beings. In the case of an elephant, it's a good thing. <laughs> but, um, but you'll see that there's an important distinction. So looking at these examples, uh, you know, I don't, I don't assume that I know the answer. I look in the case of text by text and, and try to find out. We have a little bit more time. I'd like to encourage students. Do you have questions? Do you have I know many of you keep pets. You are very attached <laughs> to your pet. And also, you are involved in various kinds of ecological movements and what have you. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you, you just mentioned that maybe animals doesn't have emotional level. But sometimes we see animals sacrifice themselves to save people. I wonder why they have this kind of behavior. I would say. It, I mean, uh, if, if I were an ancient, great. What I would say is, 
Animals have an instinctive attachment to a very young. It's warm. And they will sacrifice themselves sometimes to protect their young. So what do you need to do? There is babies. So what you need to do is you need to train the animal to think of you as his baby. And you can. Or its parent. Uh, let me give you a good metaphor. There's a story that's called imprinting. Ducks, chickens. Have you ever seen ducks? The mother duck walks, and all the little ducklings are walking yes. behind it. Yes. How do they know? Well, it turns out that the very, very early, the first thing that the little ducklings see when they come out of the egg is the thing they follow. Mm -hmm. And if you take the ducklings, and as soon as they come out of the egg, and instead of showing them their mother, which is what they normally show, show them a big ball every day and move the ball along, they will follow the ball. Because that's the first early experience they have and that dominates everything. So when you train animals to become attached to their owners, you can transfer the attachment to yourself that they would normally feel toward their parents or toward their children. So what you do is you take their instinctive responses and transfer them to something else. They're still instant. They still don't know they're sacrificing their lives for you. Why? They aren't saying, she's a good person and I want her to go save, to, to save others. They do it instinctively, but they have very great capacities for loving and as long as you understand their instinctive. One more question. I want to come back. Students, any more questions? thinking about the instinct and reason, they seem to me a, like a similar construct. What about the reason? That's what they do have. The idea is that the animals don't have reasons. They don't do something because they say to themselves, this is why. And belief is very closely related to language. Remember that the Greeks are very closely tying up his language and, and, uh, and his rationality. So that's where they're drawing that exactly there. That's a very good question. Yeah, I just want to make this comment about wild animals and this business about instinct and relationship with men. This happened when I was about four years old. My father was an engineer. He had just completed a highway in the forest. And he took me along for the final drive through that highway. I was very excited. But as we reached the forest area, <clears throat> over the hill into going down to the plains. The road was blocked by logs, you know, the trees on the way, and there were herd of elephants around, those wild elephants, trumpets in the wind. My father stopped, he said, nothing to fear. He went back to the trailer of our Land Rover, <clears throat> picked up bananas, and strings of bananas, and he walked up right to the herd. the logs and let us pass by. It drew tears to my eyes and till today when I think about it, what happened? So when I asked my father what happened, he said, look, I was 14 days on elephant track tracing this highway, right? And I camped in the forest for several days while the highway was built and these elephants protected me. So you see, there was a relationship between my father and these wild animals, wild I knew they would be waiting for this trip. Now that's it. How did my father know? He said, I knew they would be waiting. And that's why the trailer was full of bananas and sugar cane and stuff like that. Now I couldn't explain that. Till today I think about it. And it's I, as of like tears comes to my eyes. <laughs> these elephants, these wild creatures knew my father. Well, just some way the lion knew the person yeah. who had trained it or who had pulled the story. Yeah. These stories are true in lions and do learn it. And I think they're fascinating stories, but with different ways of explaining it. Uh, maybe the Greeks gave too little credit, maybe we give too much, too hard to know. But uh, 
this is why we read these people, to make us, to make us think about these questions. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I think I know why you still have tears in your eyes. <laughs> because you wanted the bananas. Even if you did You didn't get them, that's why. Yeah. Well, let us thank once again.